As always, it's a great privilege to be able to stand before you. I'm thankful for the opportunity, as I am all the time. When God came in the flesh, the world saw man as God wanted men to be. Jesus was that perfect man. His character comprised those things, or just those traits, that the ideal man should have. If men aspire to be perfect in this life, which we should, they have but to observe and emulate those traits found in Christ. We have to look at what the things he had to say, the things he did, and even how he said those things. But if we do want to be perfect, we must emulate those things. Now, part of that includes those negative things that he had to say. The qualities that we oftentimes find so politically incorrect today. Worldly wisdom had so warped man's understanding and judgment that the moral attributes found in Jesus' life were detestable. They were despised. And it is indeed true of that today. Many of the good things, all the good things that Jesus taught, the things he had to say, by and large, the world hates those things. But nonetheless, that's our example to follow. So our first point we'd like to discuss this morning, vain reasoning and blinded to the truth. How we can be that way today. By inspiration, the Apostle Paul explains why and how this is true in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, which reads, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor themselves, or excuse me, their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served a creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto their vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, marking that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So we see where mankind chose to be in that state. Nonetheless, their foolish heart was darkened. Another great truth helps us to understand why worldly people have such warped concepts of right and wrong, correct versus unacceptable. The God of this world, which is Satan, has blinded them to the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul wrote about the man of sin, which is an agent of, of Satan. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. It says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause shall God send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. By and large, people do not love the truth. And that's one reason why Jesus was so despised in their eyes and why many of people today despise Jesus. Secondly, we'll look at at the divine character. Jesus is unfashionable to worldly men whose ideals, morality, and wisdom are flawed. 
They try to recast the character or Jesus' character into their own mold. This is not the first time men have tried to force deity into conforming to man's marred standard of what they think the perfect man is. I've seen it in a couple books where they pose the question, was Jesus gay? And they would say yes. That's one way society tries to mold the God-man, Jesus the Christ, into their mold. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, God charged the people of Israel with doing this very same thing, trying to make God after their image. In Psalm 50, verse 21, it says, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. God is not as we are. Jesus' character traits he enjoins his followers to assimilate in their own lives have been unpopular with people estranged from God. That's nothing new. It's always been that way. Those qualities valued by God are the ones most despised by the world. But they are the very attributes that distinguish the Christian, the very child of God, from other men and make them just as novel as Jesus was in the flesh. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. Third, we consider worldly men are hostile to the divine ideal. Worldly men, speaking again in generalities, are exceedingly poor judges of what constitutes acceptable character traits. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. And Proverbs 16, 25. It's not within us to direct our steps. We might even have the way we think we ought to go, but we're told in, the, in those ways are the ways of death. This is why the more negative, aggressive traits of Jesus and his apostles that were demonstrated and endorsed are especially obnoxious to most people today, and certainly of the first century time when they were presented. Worldly wisdom has so influenced great numbers of professed Christians that they refuse to preach or even practice these qualities. They re reject completely what scriptures teach. They have shown how unlike Christ and how hostile the divine ordeal they really are to those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. 20. For instance... These folks, they believe the lie that everyone, especially their brethren in Christ, must speak only in a positive way and reject everything negative. Now think about that, what I just said. Is that not odd? They adamantly insist that this should characterize everyone except themselves. They are so blinded that they do not realize their own criticism of others is in it, is of itself a negative statement. To them, a no-no. When they tell those who will listen to their lying words that they must not be negative, they themselves are being negative. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. There is, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. There's some pretty negative statements in that passage. Many today would find that disgusting, would dispute it. But nonetheless, again, we point out Jesus was despised for the things he taught, the things he said, and the way he lived. Fourth, we wish to consider those who just straight up ignore God's word. These unbelievers ignore the testimony of, a God, of God's own book. They portray Christ as a mealy mouth, milk toast coward who would never say anything to upset others. 
Such people are distressed or as distressed as his first century disciples and are not just, uh, just ashamed, but they're extremely ashamed that Jesus would label those who misled and deceived the unsuspecting as being offspring of vipers. Now, can you imagine your Savior saying, you're an offspring of viper? But he did, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. It fit the characteristics that they exhibited. Jesus even called Peter a very unflattering term. He called him Satan. In the same verse, he told Peter that he was not minding the things of God, Matthew 16, verse 23. These were very negative statements. But nonetheless, they were true. In the preceding chapter, Matthew 15, Jesus charged the Pharisees with ignoring the very will of God. Verses 3 and 6 of Matthew 15. He then called them hypocrites in verse 7. And then verse 9, he told them that their worship to God was in vain. Consider that now. These were partially the, the rulers or the leaders of Israel. It was in this context that the spiritual weakness of his disciples and we find Jesus' response to them were made known. Again, Matthew chapter 15, there in verse 12 through 14, it says, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Does that not describe by and large the religious world today? We have all sorts of denominations. We have the religion of atheism. And yes, that is a religion. We have all these other religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, though those are quite old and as far as history is concerned. We also have Islam. We have distortions of religion. They all teach something different. They're blind leaders of the blind. Fifth, we wish to point out many are afraid of offending men. The disciples were deeply concerned about offending such influential men. Remember, these were the Pharisees. They would have avoided it if at all possible, if the matter had been left to them. However, it wasn't. The master teacher was present. Jesus pointed out that these Jewish leaders were teaching what God had not taught nor authorized. As we read earlier, plants which God had not planted. And such teaching would be rooted up. You don't find any ifs, ands, or buts in that statement. When Jesus told them to leave these blind guides alone, they didn't. In fact, they, they too find themselves in the same pit of religious error into which false teachers had fallen. We too can do the same thing. Sixth, we want to consider the battle between truth and error. We've already stated that truth is by and large hated by many today. So much was at stake in this great battle between truth and error. After all, it is the destiny of men's souls. After all, we will occupy eternity. It's either going to be heaven or hell. And that is determined how we live in this life. Jesus, the champion of truth, could not remain silent and have allow Satan to win the day. He will not allow his disciples to do it either because of this misplaced allegiance to the Pharisees, their code of etiquette that was dictated by worldly wisdom. Jesus said what needed to be said when it needed to be said. Thus he showed some things that are more important than humanly imposed rules. Could anything demonstrate more vividly than that, or that man-made edicts, even those honored by culture and society? Oftentimes, we intentionally or sometimes accidentally frustrates, frustrate God's will by keeping these edicts. We put, uh, quote, cultured society on a, a much higher pedestal than God. 
And certainly the Pharisees of the first century did the same thing. They put etiquette over what needed to be done. Now, we need to bear in mind also that this does not mean they're Christian. Remember what that is, an individual that is of Christ. This does not mean that a Christian can be mean-spirited, malicious, slanderous, or even hateful in anything that he or she does. On the contrary, we are commanded to speak the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. We are commanded to be gentle, forbearing, meek toward all men. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We're also commanded to consider our own selves as we correct others. Realizing that we may also need correction at some point in the future. Galatians 6, 1. But these things, they have to work together. We do have to correct others. We have to do it the right way. As God has outlined. As Jesus did. At the, si at the same time, we all must speak the things which befit sound doctrine. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. And we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was uh, once for all delivered unto the saints. Jude 3. Even liberals of the church today will, are familiar with 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. They might despise it, and more than likely they do, among other things, but they know it's there. We're told, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I was told, I think it was Brother Keeble that said, preach it when they want to hear it, preach it when they don't. Point is, we preach it. Exactly how Jesus would have and did. Seventh, we want to consider wolves in sheep's clothing. Modern infidels in sheep's clothing would never tell a fornicator, keep in mind we're talking about an assembly, they would never tell a fornicator that he or she was lost unless they repented and obeyed the Lord especially if that individual was a big contributor. After all, they might lose that contribution. You know, that almighty dollar, we can't do much of anything without it. Isn't that dollar, isn't that contribution much more important than the immortal soul that that sinner possesses and that will inher or in inhabit eternity? They would never upset those who had power to get a preacher fired, nor to have a member ostracized. It'd be, at that point, it becomes more of a political, political game to them. Who can we appease today? Because tomorrow I might need something. They supposedly reason that such sinners must not be made to feel guilty or that they must obey God's will if they are to be saved. Because after all, we cannot be negative to them. That's at least their idea of it. Judging by their speech and actions, it is not amiss to charge that such false brethren today are just as distressed as Jesus' disciples were in the first century when he told sinners, which includes all men, that they were lost. Jesus convicted men of sin and called them to repentance. After all, he's the great physician. He exposed false teachers, hypocrites, religious leaders of the day, religious charlatans of every stripe in no uncertain terms. You didn't have to go back and say, well, did Jesus really mean that? You knew exactly what he meant by the words he said. He was, it was said of him that he spoke as having one with authority, not as the scribes. Today, do these wolves in the body of Christ believe anyone is lost? I think that's a, val a valid question. But not just those particular wolves, but in general. Do we, as members of the body of Christ, do we fully believe that those outside of the body of Christ, those who have sin in their lives, are eternally lost? And that they will face a devil's hell unless they are reconciled to God? Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. 
you have to wonder, does it ever occur to these blind teachers, these blind leaders, that sinners might repent if they were actually confronted with the truth, if they were confronted with the current shape of their soul, if they were shown God's will on the matter? You can't help but think about Jonah. I don't want to go over there. They might repent. Is that how some of these wolves operate? I have no doubt. But also it could be us in our ignorance. Could it be that they have no faith in God and His transforming power of the gospel or the ability of God to accomplish those things which He has promised? Romans chapter 1 verse 16 it's God's power to salvation. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, which reads, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent. There's a lot of negative things in there, particularly the word shall. When I was at Sam Houston, and I was taking an English class, I say shall, it's part of my regular vocabulary, and I wrote that in my essay. In fact, my essay was over abortion. And uh, my teacher who found out later was a socialist, and he didn't have any problem with it. He said, you can't use negative terms like shall and murder. They're too condemning. Are they really? Jesus pointed out that's just the bold-faced truth. You call a spade a spade, even if it wants to be identified as a club. You can take that as far as you can throw it. <laughs> we have noted that Jesus' character had many sides. And there's many things that we have not noted today. But in fact, this is the case. Jesus, the master teacher, our perfect example was meek and humble. He was loving and patient. He was the Lamb of God. John chapter 1 verse 29. We also know that he was courageous, unwavering. And strong, the Lion of Judah, Revelation verse, or chapter 5, verse 5. He never courted popularity at the expense of what men needed to know. And they needed to hear the truth about sin in their hearts and lives. He never held back. Now there's always the right way to go about teaching certain things. There's many things we can learn on how Jesus dealt with these people. Jesus told men what they had to do in order, or that they had to believe and do in order to be forgiven of their sins and to be reconciled to God. We cannot do anything less. And we can be sure that the faithfulness that our faithfulness to God will it's going to make us quite unpopular. Being more faithful to God means we're less faithful to the world and ultimately we should not be faithful to the world at all. This makes us just as despised as Jesus was. Our master said in Luke chapter 6, verse 26, Warn to you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. If everybody has nice things to say about you, you've got some problems. It could be that you're not letting your light shine as God has directed because when you preach truth, darkness hates you. Darkness hates the light. And they're going to manifest it through physical means. Could be verbal means, but they're going to show you. Jesus also warned in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. 
If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. <clears throat> now certainly there are many that will follow God's law. But by comparison, they are quite few. You think about Pentecost. 3,000 sounds like a great number. And certainly it is. But compare that to the actual number of people that were there. That's a small percentage. Matthew 7 says there will be few that find eternity in heaven. It's a very narrow gate. Straight is the gate. Many people, it's just not appealing to them. And we can't make them follow it. But it is our obligation, our duty, our responsibility to show them that way. Not just how we live, but certainly by our teaching. Each of the traits that we've just discussed are hated by the world. In fact, these traits were why our Savior was crucified. He pointed out what was wrong with individuals and groups of people, and they hated him for it. He did not fit into society's mold. This is where the title of this lesson comes from, The Unfashionable Christ. It was certainly true of the first century, it is definitely true now in our time. Why, just a few days ago, we had that court case in Dallas about a seven-year-old boy that said he wanted to be a girl, and his mother is trying to make sure that happens. Come to find out, he was living in a fantasy world, and he thought he was a female character in cartoons. He was doing exactly what children do. They use their imaginations. And I suspect this woman, this is cer certainly my just speculation, she wanted a daughter. And instead, she got a son. So let's chemically alter this child to make him into a girl. Well, thankfully, our governor stepped in. And there's been many comments about the actions of this woman, but it was ruled that the father had a say in that. Imagine that. A family unit acting as a family unit. Now, it turns out that these two were separated. I think they're divorced, but they do have a child. This is where society is now. We have children raising children, and they're not allowed to be children because I think, honestly, that many of these parents are also living in their own fantasy world. They cannot live in reality. They don't want to live in reality, and they're going to do whatever they can to appease their conscience whether that means tearing down our, their brothers and sisters in Christ or slowly chipping away at society's morals. And they have done a great job at doing that. Where are we as members of the church? We, like we said, we can't force people to obey the truth. But it's our job to take it to them. To the world, these qualities which we've just referenced, we've discussed are absurd and hated. But to the Christian, they should be adored and they should be how we pattern our lives. Fundamentally, it is the attitude of obedience to God, the Father, that Jesus showed the world. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind of Christ be in you. Okay, We can't have that mind of Christ in us if we don't know what his mind contained. And we have it readily available today. We have it all across the world. Thankfully, it's translated in I don't know how many different languages. It's there if we want to read it. We have no excuse. We today must show forth that same example if we desire to have heaven as our long home. If we are to have heaven as our home, we must follow God's plan. The plan that is found in Jesus' last will and testament, the very New Testament in our Bibles. It's something you can read about, something you can learn. Nonetheless, God's plan of salvation is quite simple. It starts out with five steps. Hearing his word, Romans 10, 17. Building your belief in it, as well as his son, John 8, 24. Repenting of your past sins, Acts 3, 19. Confessing Christ before others, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And finally, putting your Lord on in baptism, Acts 22, verse 16. From that point forward, you are a Christian. And the Lord has added you to his church, Acts 2, verse 47. From that point until the, the end of your life, 
it was it was pointed out in a debate we watched a while back. All we're given is a little dash. You look at tombstones, born in 19-whatever, died in 19-whatever. All we have is that little dash. How are we using our dash? But it's that dash that's going to determine where we end up in eternity. From the point of baptism, when we become a child of God, we must live faithful to death, unto death. Revelation 2, verse 10. Now, perhaps you already are a child of God, but you've allowed error back into your life. You know, kids do that all the time. You tell them what to do, what not to do. They might obey for a little while, but every now and then they stumble. And then they need some discipline. Especially boys, they get a lot of it. Or at least they need a lot of it. God chastens us today through His Word, through members of the church preaching God's Word. If you do have sin in your life and you are a child of God, repentance and prayer will restore you to a proper relationship with your Creator. 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and James chapter 5, verse 17. The choice is yours. You're going to follow a plan. Is it God's plan you're following? Or is it Satan's? Some of Jesus' disciples could not handle his, quote, hard sayings. So they left. John chapter 6, verse 6, or 60, excuse me. John chapter 6, verse 66. They left the master teacher. The choice is also yours today. If you have need of removing sin, no matter what it might be, please make it known as together we stand and sing.